Now some of you may already know about the infamous case of a guy using the alias by the name of D.B. Cooper. For those who don't know the story, let me explain. On November 24th, 1971, a man using the alias by the name of D.B. Cooper aboarded Northwest Airlines Flight 305. The flight was going from Portland, Oregon all the way to Seattle, Washington, when suddenly during the flight, Cooper would pass one of the stewardess a note saying he had a bomb. After showing the stewardess his bomb, he would list out his demands, which included $200,000, four parachutes, and a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the plane on arrival. Soon after receiving his money and parachutes, the plane would take off and transit to Reno, Nevada. However, during the flight, he would open up the air stair and parachute with $200,000 strapped to his body. The fate of Cooper after that jump remains unknown, and as of this upload, the FBI still has not solved the case to this day. But little did anyone know at the time that in just 11 years, NASCAR would have its own version of D.B. Cooper. So let's get into it. In early 1982, a driver from Nashville, Tennessee began gearing up for the Winston 500. He told everyone his name was L.W. Wright and began to go about the necessary steps to compete in the race on May 2nd. The first step was securing money. Wright was able to get quite a large sum from Bernie Terrell, the head of Space Age Marketing in Nashville. Wright was able to get $30,000 in cash for a car and $7,500 for other expenses. The next step was purchasing a stock car. For that, he approached none other than fellow Tennessee driver Sterling Marlin. Marlin sold him a Chevrolet for just over 20 grand. However, Wright would pay 17 grand in cash while the final 3700 came in a check. He was then able to talk with NASCAR into giving him his competitor's license and pit passes. He wrote the sanctioning body a check for $1,500. Soon after, Wright contacted the Tennessean newspaper seeking publicity. The story was that Wright would enter the Winston 500 in a car bought from Sterling Marlin. Now here's when things begin to become suspicious. Wright had claimed that he had already raced in 43 NASCAR Winston Cup Series events. To add more, he claimed that his car was being sponsored by country singer T.G. Shepard. So we now arrive to the weekend of the Winston 500, and Wright had entered the number 34 Chevrolet for a team he called Music City Racing. Now back in the day, the media was not able to research topics as well as they are now, but they still could tell he wasn't what he claimed to be. When asked, Wright admitted that the T.G. Shepard sponsorship announcement was premature, but he was still working on sponsorship from other country music stars. Also, none of the Winston Winston Cup Series drivers remembered racing against Wright, and he was asked about this as well. His story then changed right on the spot as he had claimed he had competed on Winston Cup Series tracks in sportsman competition. With his license already approved, NASCAR allowed him to race despite the mystery behind him. Wright qualified at a speed just over 187 miles per hour for the race in which Benny Parsons became the first driver to qualify over 200 miles per hour. On his second lap of qualifying, Wright spun out and hit the wall with the front of the car. The damage was repairable and later fixed in time for the race. Keep in mind that Sterling Marlin was still around to give his customer advice on the race, but even he grew suspicious of Wright. He he was quoted in saying he kept asking questions any driver should have known. He didn't seem to know much about what was going on. We now arrive to race day, and L.W. Wright is slotted to start 36 in row 18. Row number 18, Tommy Dale and L.W. Wright. However, Wright's engine would expire by lap 13 and would be relegated to a 39th place finish. This was when all hell began to break loose, because after the race, Wright immediately vanished, leaving the car behind and taking only a tractor trailer rig along with him. Marlin discovered the check received for the car had bounced, which really wasn't much of a surprise to him. NASCAR soon discovered that the $1,500 check for his competition license had bounced as well. Multiple arrest warrants were soon issued for Wright, from the likes of NASCAR themselves, Goodyear, and another auto parts company. By late June, the facts were known and Wright's story was in sports sections across the country. Bernie Terrell, the guy who loaned him over 37 grand to make this deal happen, hired a private detective to track his whereabouts. He was quoted in saying, I have hired a private detective to track him down and we'll get him sooner or later. He'll end up in jail before we're through. <laughs> Unfortunately, as it turned out, 
that wouldn't happen. Yes, folks, it has been over 35 years since this whole thing went down, and L.W. Wright's whereabouts are still unknown. This is without a doubt one of NASCAR's biggest embarrassments as a sport, and probably one they want you to forget. What's funny about this is he actually has his own racing reference page, the link is in the description, and we don't even know if that was his real name, it was probably just some alias. This guy, for a brief moment, fooled companies, drivers, the media, and NASCAR's sanctioning body. Much respect. NASCAR's version of D.B. Cooper has faded off into darkness, and in the years that followed, he has remained completely unknown. And once again, that'll do it for another video. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Black Lives Matter. Catch you next time.